this culture we have lived under, particularly in Europe, over the past 20 or 30 years, where we lived under a culture basically of you can't say that. There are certain things you shouldn't say about immigration. There are certain things you shouldn't say about multiculturalism. There are certain views you shouldn't express in public or in polite society. I think that was one of the contributory factors to um, people deciding that they wanted to shake up the political system by voting for populist parties or by voting for Brexit. Uh, there was a desire to kick back against what felt like a very stifling, technocratic, managerial political style. I think in the US it expressed, it expressed itself in um, the turn of people towards Trump, but towards the, the most anti-establishment figure, and against uh, Hillary Clinton, who was the, was the archetypal establishment figure, although I understand, of course, that Hillary Clinton got more votes in the public vote than, than Trump did. Um, so I think one of the consequences of having a political culture which constantly tells people, you can't think this, you can't say this, you have to just know your place and do as we tell you and so on is that there will be this kind of revolt, there will be this kind of reaction. So I think there's actually something positive. Even though there are many downsides to the populist climate we're currently going through, there are some positives too, primarily that people are showing that they are not going to always put up with arrogant political parties and will demand change when they feel change is necessary. I think there's also another problem, which is uh, we live in an age where very few politicians of any party actually have a, a vision of the future. It's very, very rare when you have uh, people with strong program ideologies. It's not an ideological age. They're not uh, offering us a, a kind of a coherent set of principles. Um, and I think that's a very big problem because if you don't have a debate about principles, you don't have a debate about what kind of future you would like to see, then what tends to happen is you personalize politics. And I think one of the things that we've seen in a lot of places in the world is that politics has become very personal. It's about the character of the individual. And very often when people criticize Trump or Clinton or anybody else, what they are criticizing is not necessarily what they say, but what they really mean. In other words, they're more interested in the, not the story that partisan politicians give you, but the story behind the story. And I think we're continually having this political uh, form of debate where we're kind of shadow boxing and personalizing the attacks are extremely nasty and, and, and brutally personal. And I think under those circumstances, you know, you do end up in a situation where demagogy and uh, uh, dishonesty and, 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 and unprincipled behavior become the norm. And I think the, the tragedy is, is that everybody in this room can recognize when they do that. It's very, very clear that they're being manipulative. But when we're, our side is doing that, we're not aware of that. There's a kind of double standard that we all have. You can see the sort of what they're doing, but not when we're doing the same thing. And I think it was very interesting. I, I wrote a book recently on, on the politics of fear. And one of the things that came up with the politics of fear, you could see Trump practicing fear all the time. Uh, and people say, oh yeah, politics of fear, that's Trump. But when Clinton says that the biggest, the, the thing we have to fear more than anything else is Trump, people don't necessarily recognize that she too is using the politics of fear. There's a kind of you know, vision that doesn't embrace the whole situation. And I think uh, a lot of the problems that we have is this inability to transcend our, our immediate position and depersonalize politics. We have to really depersonalize politics. Va a ser una sola pregunta más, de manera que si quieres hazla tú y es la última pregunta. ¿sí? Eh, en relación a la libertad de expresión, eh, se hicieron varios movimientos, eh, por ejemplo el feminista, y bueno, a lo largo de los años se fue cambiando la idea central del feminismo. Eh, hace poco en Puebla tuvimos un incidente en el que los feministas que estaban a favor del aborto empezaron a atentar. Eh, con los monumentos históricos que tenemos en la ciudad entonces se generó muchísima polémica en, en, en esos días como sociedad que nos corresponde hacer para que la idea central de esos movimientos no se pierda y se siga resultando la libertad de expresión a ver yo creo que hay que distinguir dos tipos de feminismo hay más tipos de feminismo pero en general tiene un feminismo que es de origen liberal que lo que busca básicamente es la igualdad 
de la mujer en términos sociales y legales, jurídicos, básicamente. La misma dignidad y por lo tanto las mismas oportunidades que los hombres. Pero entiende que somos complementarios, hombres y mujeres, y que por lo tanto podemos colaborar para que la sociedad avance y, y, y no estamos necesariamente en conflicto. Luego tú tienes un feminismo de raigambre marxista, si tú quieres, que sostiene cosas que no son compatibles con la sociedad libre y la sociedad abierta, como por ejemplo que la mujer es por definición la víctima de la opresión sistemática del sistema creado por los hombres, del patriarcado, lo que es una estúpida. Pero ellas lo dicen, y por eso me gusta Camille Pague y otras feministas que han salido a atacar este, este tipo de, de feminismo, que son, al final, formas de odio de transferir la lucha de clases, tal vez no del proletario al, al empresario, sino que entre los géneros, una especie de lucha de clases de género, que es absurdo. Todos tenemos gente amada que es de los dos, de los dos géneros, que son hombres, que son mujeres, queremos que la sociedad avance. Entonces, yo te diría que una forma de enfrentarlo con la discusión racional es eh, siendo muy estricto a la hora de que no, no permitirles eh, censurarte, decir lo que tú piensas, y poner límites cuando se ponen violentos desde el punto de vista físico. Porque eso también ocurre. Llegan al punto, muchas veces lo hemos visto nosotros en otras partes, de ser agresivos físicamente. Eso es completamente intolerable desde todo punto de vista. Y, y por lo demás hay que atreverse a hablar. Porque uno de estos los problemas que tienen es que estos grupos minoritarios radicales son tan agresivos que la gente se silencia. Vivimos en una cultura del miedo y del silencio, donde ustedes que pueden no estar de acuerdo en este tema o en otros temas, no se atreven a manifestar su opinión y por lo tanto estos grupos radicales que son minoritarios, no se equivoquen, son minoritarios, terminan imponiendo la agenda y terminan imponiendo lo que finalmente se hace. Si tenemos una clase política en buena medida integrada por cobardes en Occidente, que se ha tomado muy en serio la presión, muchas veces ilegítima, de grupos minoritarios agresivos para aprobar normas y endosar discursos que terminan siendo tentatorios contra la libertad de expresión y la libertad de tomar una serie de decisiones. Así que, yo te diría eso. Yes. I'll uh, my answer is brief. So I will say uh, that I think what we want to try to do is exercise critical vigilance and to show respect for legitimate differences. So for me that means with respect to feminism or any other social movement is to acknowledge the fact that there are different views of what gender equality should look like and to pay attention to those differences and give a voice and space. Muchas gracias.